we're gonna get started. I'll be super brief. Uh, first off, thanks for coming. This is an awesome turnout. Uh, second, more importantly, on behalf of the Private Equity Club, we'd like to introduce and thank for coming Jerry O'Brien. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of O'Brien Staley Partners, or OSP, out of Minneapolis. Uh, Jerry and his team were in town earlier this year giving a more traditional speech on kind of the investment strategy of his firm. And now we're very fortunate to have him back to, of course, talk about raising funds. So if you could uh, join me and give him a nice warm up. If anybody comes late, we got one open seat. Ah, oh, perfect. Open seat right in the front. Uh, thank you, Tristan. Appreciate it. And we were at the Orrington Hotel uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, we present the firm and the investment strategies. We're not going to do investment strategies this time. We're going to talk about <laughs> just raise a fund. You have to, I want you to say just raise a fund because that's kind of the way I always heard it on the trading desk whenever anybody got pissed off. They always said, you know what? We ought to quit. We ought to just raise our own funds. And it was the way they used the word just that kind of made me think they didn't know what they were talking about. And uh, so we'll go through it. As Tristan said, I'm, I'm Jerry O'Brien. I'm the O'Brien and O'Brien Staley Partners. Uh, I've got a couple of my co-workers here with me, our summer associate, Sarah, maybe everybody already knows you, but we just make sure everybody knows who Sarah is. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Homerson, I'm a second year here at Kellogg, and this summer I was a summer associate, largely working on the impact fund, um, but getting some exposure also to the value fund, it was an awesome experience, I highly encourage all of the first years to apply. Um, before Kellogg, I was working at Institutional Portfolio Management in San Francisco. Good. And Jill, maybe everybody's gotten emails from you, but if you just... Yes, probably. Yeah. I'm Jill Walrappi. I'm the Director of Talent Recruiting for OSP, and I um, was hired to help people like yourselves looking for to launch a career in credit to think about OSP and the value of investing and uh, alternative asset management and a variety of things that don't take up a lot of time. Prior to working at OSP, I worked at Carn Hill with Jerry and yours, and... Um, uh, so, as I said, I'm, I'm Jerry O'Brien, uh, the O'Brien of O'Brien Staley Partners. Staley is Warren Staley, and Warren is the retired chairman and CEO of Cargill Incorporated. Uh, he was at Cargill for 39 years, uh, and uh, even though he was there for 39 years, mandatory retirement age is 65. So he was the chairman and CEO of Cargill that faced mandatory retirement. I was at Cargill for 17 years, and uh, I really uh, admired Warren and thought, you know, I, I enjoyed working for the firm and being associated in large part to the tone Warren set at the very top. So when it came time for Warren to retire, uh, I made it a point to go to his retirement party, and it was a room kind of like a little bigger room. But there was a buffet, there was a bar, and nobody was eating at the buffet, and everybody knew better than to get a drink in the middle of the day at Cargill. But uh, I, it was a long receiving line, and I waited my turn to wish him well. And when I got up, I shook his hand, and I said, thank you, Warren, for setting the tone at the top. I've always loved being associated and, and uh, representing the firm due to you know the tone you set. And as we're shaking hands, he, he said, you're welcome. And he held my hand a little bit longer than normal. And then he planted the seed. He said, you know, if you ever want to do something entrepreneurial, you'll give me a call, won't you? Which was not what I was expecting at his retirement party. And I said, well, sure, or of course. And I kind of you know let other people have their time. And I was looking over my shoulder. I was wondering, is he saying that to everybody? And, uh, you know, is he really pissed off about the 65-year-old mentor at retirement age? And he was not. It was just one personal, you know, scene. And uh, eight or nine months later, I didn't do anything about it. Eight or nine months later, uh, I was at church with my wife, Lisa, and I saw Warren and his wife, Mary Lynn. And at the end of the Mass, I caught up with him, asked him how retirement was going. He had a spring in his step. He was 65 and a half years old. He no longer had the weight of the multinational cargo on his shoulders. Uh, he was on the board of U.S. Bank for 10 years, and he was chair of their audit committee when they went through Sarbanes Oxley the first time, and he didn't have that responsibility anymore. And he was on the board of Target Corp. And I don't know if you guys remember, but a few years back, Target had one of the first major data breaches, and he didn't have that responsibility anymore either. And so he repeated the same invitation, you know, if you want to do something entrepreneurial, you'll let me know, won't you? And, and uh, you know, I, I, I never had the courage to ask, but his wife Mary Lynn kind of had this little glimmer in her eye and, and uh, I think what she was trying to say is get him out of my kitchen he has too much energy and uh, uh, as I walked away uh, uh, my wife Lisa uh, who has a PhD in psychology she punches me in the shoulder and she says 
That's what an invitation looks like. Why don't men ever know when they're getting an invitation? I said, honey, I, I got it, I got it. He said the same thing eight months ago. I said, eight months ago when you haven't done anything about it. So okay, so you know, I had to start thinking about it. But the invitation from Warren wasn't to do a trade, and it wasn't to launch a fund, it was to build a firm. And, and so I gave serious consideration to that. And, and what I'm going to tell you is the journey of the fund. We gave you these handouts, uh, and, and you'll, you can look in there. There's an email uh, that we uh, replicated that I gave to the team the very first time. And I'm going to kind of walk through that. But first, I promised the compliance guys just what you were all hoping is that I would show you this boilerplate. But like you're at the auto car, you don't need to read the whole thing. Just initial here and here. It's for discussion purposes only. You're not invited to invest. Uh, previous piss offedness is no indication of future piss offedness. And uh, okay, we're done with that. This is the, uh, the email that I was talking about. And these are the 24 steps. And I'll field questions, but I'm not actually going to go through 24 steps. Rather, uh, we break it up into five themes, three precursors and two execution. Uh, and so this is the way I'm going to walk you, walk you through this. What I'm hoping to do is to make the big picture uh, that you walk away from this presentation is that it's not just about uh, calling up investors. You've got to worry about everything. And all of these steps are necessary if you want to raise a fund. You need to raise a firm, build a firm to raise a fund. So let me let, walk you through the rest of the stuff. So, you know, the first thing you're going to need is you're going to need an office. And this is actually our office in Edina, Minnesota. Uh, and there's a story behind this. It used to be an apartment building. It's three blocks away from our house, about two blocks away from Warren's house. And, and uh, it, the, the building was vacant. There was a realtor who got the condo conversion bug back in 2006, 2007, right, you know, leading into the credit recession. Uh, and uh, he hired an architect, and he didn't control the scope of the engagement. So the architect must have drawn pictures all day and all night, ran up a $400,000 architect's bill, and he attached it to the property of the mechanics lien, which was enough to make it a, you know, an inviolable project. I, I would drive by this building on my way to work uh, every day, and I'd say, man, this place looks like crud. Somebody ought to do something. And I would come back from work and say, it still looks like crud. And I was like, holy cow, I didn't realize there'd be a non-performing loan right in my own neighborhood. So I, I you know, called up the bank and I bought the mortgage. Uh, and I called up this young, he was about 32 year old uh, residential realtor. And I said, it's your lucky day. We're gonna do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And he said, well, what's that mean? I said, it means, you know, I'm gonna send over some legal papers. You're gonna sign them. We're gonna sign whatever I send you and we'll release your personal guarantee. He said, Good deal. We'll do that. So we did. But three days after I released this personal guarantee, I got a call from the Edina police saying, are you the owner of the property at 4121 West 50th Street? I was like, whoa, it's the police. I'm thinking, is there a dead body in the dumpster? What the hell? You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I said, ownership's not entirely clear. And uh, he said, well, we just thought you'd like to know water's coming out the second floor window. Holy cow, second floor. I don't know a lot about plumbing, but it's coming out the second floor. I bet the first floor is a total gone. And so the whole thing had been, he didn't pay the heat bill. All the pipes ruptured in the whole building. So we gutted it, and then we rebuilt it. Uh, and I cut a deal with the Edina building inspector. It used to have a resident manager's office. And I said, you know, if I make that resident manager's office on the walkout lower level into a handicap accessible unit, could I move my personal office upstairs? And so we did. And so we put the first office, our, our, our office, up on the top floor uh, and have enjoyed it ever since. The neat thing was it continued to be on the ground floor uh, residential. So from the very beginning of building O'Brien Staley Partners, I was rent free. And in fact, I was cash flow positive because the four or five apartment units were giving me the cash flow. And as you're building a firm, it's all about controlling your burn rate to extend your runway to make sure you get lift and you get off. So this was kind of fun. Uh, now, there's a second part of this story, and I think I mentioned, uh, well, this is actually the house I grew up in, in Detroit, Michigan. It's actually Northville, Michigan, if you're from the area. Uh, and my wife, who I mentioned has a PhD in uh, psychology, she said, I think we may have some things to talk about. You may have an unresolved <laughs> that we need to go clean up. All right. So anyway, the, uh, once you have your office, uh, the next thing you need to find is what I call uh, a first follower. And there's this TED talk, it's only three minutes long, uh, that actually talks about how important it is to have a first follower. And I'd like to share this with you. 
So ladies and gentlemen, at TED, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen, start to finish, in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> But what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> I guess if, if Warren Staley is the first follower, I guess that makes me the shirtless dancing guy. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I you know showed that. I, I, I love the video. I showed it in the office, and uh, a couple of the guys in the office said, Jerry, are you in that video someplace? And, you know, I'm, I'm not in that video, but there was a... Uh, uh, Muffy McMillan is the heir to the Cargill fortune, and she had a fundraiser uh, for Opportunity International uh, in her backyard, and it's a very big backyard. And uh, she hired Kiss to perform. And uh, uh, Warren uh, and Mary Lynn and Lisa and I went, we went together. But it was such a huge crowd, we kind of got separated. And uh, uh, Warren was kind of with, you know, the elder statesman, and I was just enjoying the concert. And unbeknownst to me, uh, one of our lawyers pulled out a cell phone, and he actually videotaped me. <laughs> security guards, and I was like, was, he, he was, they're great guys, but they're the kind of guys who like have a chain to go to their wallet, you know, so a little, little rough crowd. But, uh, um, the, the, another little fun thing, so we, you know, Warren and I got separated, at the end of the concert, there's big fireworks display and all that, and to raise money for charity, they actually auctioned off uh, Paul Stanley's lead guitar and Gene Simmons' axe guitar, and uh, I wound up, you know, bidding, you know, for charity and winning Paul Stanley's lead guitar for $15,000. And so at the end, you go backstage, you shake hands, quick little picture, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I'm walking out with this big guitar case, Paul Stanley's lead guitar, and I'm looking all over for Warren and Mary Lynn, because we rode there together. And I finally find Warren and Mary Lynn on the, on the far side, and there's Warren carrying the other guitar. He bought Gene Simmons' guitar, so that's the lead guitar, bass guitar. We didn't even know, we were on the opposite side. And he, to this day, he wants to tell me, Jerry, you overpaid. I paid fifteen, and he got the the axe guitar for fourteen thousand. <laughs> anyway, so once you have your you know your office and your first follower, uh, you know there's another critically important element, and 
You know, Warren was at Cargill for 39 years, and it was critically important to him that my departure be elegant and graceful and not be perceived as raiding the firm or breaking a business that would belong to Cargill. It was important to me also. I was there for 17 years, and, and you know, obviously I wanted to do things correctly, but I also knew that I wanted to secure full attribution of my investment track record. And uh, so in quiet conversation with the firm, uh, it was agreed that if I served out a two-year non-compete, which felt like an eternity, uh, I would be rewarded with my 17-year investment track record. And I invested over $3 billion in unloved U.S. CNI credits uh, for Cargill and Carval. Uh, so it was very much worthwhile. So it took two years, uh, but after the two years, we got the track record. This is just one <coughs> representation of it. And if you uh, take many marketing classes or consultancy, you have to have something that goes up and to the right. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the... The key, but uh, you know it's hard to uh, to overstate how important it is to have full data attribution. As one of my uh, uh, former coworkers said to me, the difference between having your track record and just telling people that you did a good job is the difference between being a principal and being a really talented employee. And so you know we were fortunate to secure the track record. So after the track record, uh, we started going out and just you know testing the, the message a little bit. And one of the very first uh, uh, meetings I took was with a family office in Connecticut and you know the way these offices usually work there's somebody who vets you and then there's somebody who you know reads that report and sponsors you and at the very end you're brought in to meet the patriarch of the family and so I'd gone through you know the two series and I was at the patriarch meeting uh, and uh, you know I, I, I was explaining how you know I invest in off the run orphaned uh, credit intensive, management intensive, distressed assets. I'm 45 minutes into telling the, the, the story and the patriarch says to me, he stops me in the middle of a sentence and says, I don't get it. What do you do? And you know, my, I was crestfallen. I was like, oh my God, I'm 45 minutes into this and the guy doesn't know what the hell I do. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't like it, he didn't understand it, and he doesn't invest in stuff he doesn't understand. And so I was riding the train from Connecticut back into New York, into the city. And, and I was, you know, very upset with myself because I'm a pretty good communicator. And I thought, how is it I can be 45 minutes into that meeting and the guy doesn't know what the hell I do? And I was blue. And as I'm, you know, kind of, you know, doing this introspection, I'm looking out as the train's going by and I see one of these garish yellow signs that say, we buy ugly houses. And you, every time you see it, you cringe a little bit, right? But you're not unclear. You know exactly what that guy does. And I thought, ah. Oh, I need to have a message that's that clear. You know, I don't buy ugly houses, but I do buy unloved loans. And, and that's become our, our message. And what I guess I'm trying to share with you is, you know, you need to find your message. What is it that you do? And you need to do it better than anybody else. Because people like to hire the very best at something. You don't need to be the very best at everything. You need to be the very best at something. And so narrow it down until you can find your message for what you're the very best at. And just to, to share with, with you, ours is unloved U.S. commercial industrial credits in five to twenty million dollar transactions, and that is a very defendable space. Uh, and in fact, I don't. Pete, can I highlight you? Pete, Pete's from the investment office, Northwestern, and uh, I think that Pete would say that, yeah, Jerry, that's your niche. That is your niche. <laughs> okay. So once you have your message, uh, you know, you, you need to actually have what we call proof of concept but without the old firm's letterhead. Uh, and so people want to see, you know, can you do what you did before, uh, you know, on your own without the benefit of, in my case, Cargill and Carval. And so, you know, the very first thing, people want to see that you can recruit a team, uh, and they want you to have the whole team, not just the investment team, but you have to have cash, collateral <coughs> controls, you have to have risk management, you, know, you have to have every, every department of a firm is important for the benefit of the investors. And they talk about operational due diligence. You know, are you going to clear operational due diligence? And will this team work together? Uh, and then, you know, do you have uh, regular recurring investment opportunities? And these are our three channels where we find our deal, deal flow and have for over 20 years cross business cycles. Are you going to see enough deal flow in this new firm to be selective and choosy? Or are you going to be doing any deal you find because you could, you know, you're not finding enough deals? And so that runs to your deal flow funnel. And every business has a funnel. The question is whether you know your funnel or not. And I think it's a big differentiator between someone who runs a desk and someone who runs a firm is if they really understand their funnel. The, the destroyer of alpha 
is lost deal expense. And, and my long-term hit rate of transactions underwritten to transactions being made, investments being made, uh, at Cargill and Carval was 33%. Uh, and so whatever you think my due diligence bill is, it's actually three times that because I got two dead deals for every closed deal, right? And, but that's, that's actually a viable rate. If you're only hitting 20%, now your bill's five times as much, and that will destroy your alpha, and you'll get very ordinary returns on the 20% that you get done. The last thing, this is really too small to see from the back of the room. This is a control chart, and, and uh, if we had a bigger projector screen, I guess you can see this, but... Uh, what we're showing there is all 87 trades that we've done in our very first fund uh, at O'Brien's Daily Partners on both an IRR and a multiple basis. And the red line on the top is an 8% return, and on the bottom is a 1.0 multiple. And so if you just look at the bottom one, you'll see that there are no data points below the 1.0 multiple. 87 <laughs> trades, 87 profitable trades. So that's an execution consistency that's kind of a proof of concept that the firm is working uh, even without the car deal and car valve later. Once you, once you have your, uh, you know, call it proof of concept, you got your raw ingredients and your proof of concept, then you can actually start your franchise building and you got to, you know, recruit and deploy your operations and systems people. You've also got to then, you know, worry about your brand identity and not just the firm name, although everybody keeps joking about, you know, all of the uh, Greek gods and star constellations are taken. We actually have a rival who uh, named their firm WMD. And we thought, I know, I think STD was taken. <laughs> but anyway, you gotta, you gotta build your brand identity. You gotta have your logo, your colors, your look, your feel, and you gotta you know, communicate it across the whole, whole firm. Uh, and then uh, your policies and procedures. And not just written policies and procedures, but policies and procedures that are shared and understood by the whole firm. So let me, let me give you a couple of examples. On the investment side, you know, we have a policy. We say that, hey, every deal has a compromise in it. And a lot of deals have two compromises in it. But no deal has to have three compromises. When you get to three compromises, kill the deal. There'll be another deal next week. Always has been. Always will be. You don't need to give three compromises to a deal. Uh, on, on the risk management side, we have an articulated policy that everybody understands of we're in the risk bearing business. We are here to bear risks, but we don't bear unarticulated risks. So you say it out loud, everybody hears it, and that's the risk you're going to bear. Um, and the risk manager, if there's an unarticulated risk, you know, she's tasked with elevating it to, to the chair. Then, you know, after you've got uh, all these things, you're ready to be registered with the SEC. And this is when it gets real. Right? This is when you're now a regulated entity. You do your ADV1 and ADV2 forms, uh, and, and you're you know, ready to start going out and brand evangelizing. And you know, brand evangelizing and raising, raising your fund. And, and I think there's pretty much, to my knowledge, three basic models of how to <coughs> launch your first fund and do capital raising. You might be incubated by a firm like Reservoir who will bolt you into their uh, uh, investor relations department, but then take equity in your firm. And that's forever equity, right? Or they might even take royalties, take a top line participation uh, rather than bottom line participation. Uh, or, you know, you could, uh, you, you could hire a placement firm. There's a lot of great placement firms. Uh, there's, you know, Park Hill, there's Credit Suisse, and Lazard, uh, and they're gonna charge you a placement fee for representing you and putting their sales force on it. And they take, you know, because they charge you interest on it, so they take about one and a half years compensation. Uh, and so, you know, that's the way they do it. And then you try to have tails that'll get you for the next fund or something like that. Uh, and then the third way is just to build your own staff. And when I walked with Warren Staley through these three, three models, you know, deliberating which model should we pursue, you know, Warren, you know, in the great chairman type way said, well, if we do the first model where we get incubated and give away equity, do we eventually have to build out our own department? I said, yeah, yeah, you do. And he said, if we go the second way and you hire a placement firm and they go and represent you in the market, do you eventually have to build out your own department? I said, yep, yep, you do. And he said, well, why are we avoiding the inevitable? Why don't we build our own department right now? Okay, you know, now that's taking on burn rate and that means you have to hire somebody uh, and you want to be a good cultural fit because if you hire one person <coughs> the wrong person, you kind of sunk your ship. So in pursuing this, we decided we were going to use a search firm, a headhunter, but I didn't want just any headhunter. 
because that headhunter is going to front run you in the market. That headhunter is going to represent and define your brand to every player in the, in the business before you ever get out to the marketplace. Uh, so we actually interviewed 12 firms to choose the headhunting firm. Uh, and I was very concerned about what I call boardroom demeanor. You know, I want to make sure that I would be proud to have that person representing me. Uh, and then we had the job description that, hey, you know, we're in Minneapolis. And of the 12 firms, I think nine of the 12 uh, tried to persuade me. They said, Jerry, you know, we know all the players, and you really ought to think hard about whether this position is going to be staffed in Minneapolis or in New York. And, it's, you know, I was like, oh, God, okay, I think I heard about that. Because uh, you know, I heard it so many times. I heard it like eight or nine times. And then the, the 10th firm, a firm called Caldwell Partners, uh, I actually asked them, instead of waiting for them to tell me, I said, do you think that this position has to be staffed in New York? And these guys at Caldwell Partners said, Jerry, your job is to tell me the business plan, and my job is to fill the need you have, rather than to tell you you have a different need. Uh, oh my God, you're my guy. Okay. And so Caldwell Partners, and, and we went about and did a nationwide search, and we actually wound up recruiting two very talented people. This is Mark and Jen. They were here when we were at the Orton Hotel. They're not here today. Uh, and you know we, we now have you know a full-fledged in-house investor relations department that fits our firm, I think, quite well. Uh, once, once Mark and Jen were on board, we started building out an Intralink site. And one of the things we handed out to you guys, you know, in, in the Intralink site, you know, you're going to have your, your flip book, you're going to have <laughs> your one-page description, you're going to have your ADV, your ADV2, you're going to have your PPM, your LPA, and your due diligence questionnaire, your DDQ. And we put a copy in those, in those folders of the DDQ. That DDQ, every, all the other documents are derivative of that document. And, and so, you know, eight years from now, when you're launching your first fund, you're going to be wondering, where is that Rosetta Stone? Where is that DDQ that Jerry O'Brien gave us? You know, put this in that long-term file you carry away from, from business school with you, because I'm pretty sure, you know, somebody will be texting, hey, do you still have it? Can you, can you send it over to me? So I hope you guys enjoy that. I don't know, there's like 79 questions in there that all institutional investors ask in some shape or form. And what you want to do is you want to be sure you answer the same question the same way with all of your investors. Because if you answer it one iota differently, you're compounding your compliance on a seven-year go-forward basis, right? And so you answer the DDQ, and then people will send you their own forms of DDQ but you want to map back to your same question and answer. So if it's a question about ERISA, this is the answer. If it's a question about the use of, of leverage or subscription lines, this is the answer. If it's a question about uh, you know, gaps in, your, in, your, in your, uh, your org chart or your staffing, this is the answer. You don't want to get into a place where you're giving different investors different answers. So the DDQ, I hope you can take as a gift to help you get organized when you're launching your own fund. So then you got your DDQ and you have to go out in the market. And what we have up here is our investor relations funnel. Can you read those numbers from the back of the room? So we actually met with 1,282 people uh, at 478 different institutions. So about three people you know, in a firm, but you keep track of all of them. Uh, to have 76 uh, in-person meetings, uh, 28 investors then engaged in operational due diligence and 20 of those 28 were investors in our very first fund. Uh, so that's our, that's our true funnel. And a lot of people are wondering, how many meetings do I have to have to get this thing done? Well, the answer is it's like a marathon. You don't really know when you're going to finish. You just know when you're going to get started. And the sooner you get started, the sooner you're going to finish. Uh, but you know, this is the genuine numbers for ours. One of the things that's helpful is before you start, if you decide for yourself what kind of investors do you want, uh, and some people are like, oh, I don't care, I'll take any investor, you know, bigger the check, the better, you know. Uh, but, you know, we actually had a, a quite deliberate strategy. At Cargill and Carvel, we had, you know, multi-strategy global funds, uh, and we took every flavor of investor. Uh, and what I realized is I've never lost sleep over any of my credit investments. I've lost untold amount of sleep over international tax compliance. And so we deliberately said, we just want domestic. We're going to run a domestic only strategy, which dramatically uh, uh, eliminates <coughs> complexity in our firm and our fund and our expense ratios. Uh, but doing that, we still wanted to have a diverse investor base. And so, you know, I articulated to the IR team, you know what, we would like to have two 
uh, uh, university endowments. We would like to have two public pensions. We'd like to have two corporate pensions. We'd like to have two religious or hospital systems. We'd like to have two multifamily offices. We'd like to have two ultra high net worth single family offices. We'd like to have two outsourced CIOs. And we started calling it Noah's Ark, two by two by two by two. And so uh, with that strategy, we went out and this is actually our result. This is over, over two. But we, in our first fund, we actually wound up having four university endowments, four religious slash hospital systems, one Catholic, one Protestant, one Church of Latter-day Saints, one non-denominational, uh, two public pensions, uh, one state, one city, two corporate pensions, et cetera. Uh, that has been a very robust investor base uh, for our plan and uh, you know, has paid dividends. Once you got your raw ingredients and you've got your proof of concept and then you do your franchise, <coughs> uh, you know, you've raised your capital. And now you know you need to invest, harvest, report, repeat. Invest, harvest, report, repeat. Invest, harvest, repeat. You know, it just never ends, right? You're always doing it. But you can't lose track. You need to continue to maintain the relationships that you've already forged with LPs, your current LPs and prospective LPs, with regulators, with employees, with <coughs> potential future employees, which means you need to you know, go out and be in the market. You need to go to campus and do lunch and learns and things like that. Uh, we realize that you know if you, if you put us on a spectrum of, of uh, I don't know analytical to intuitive, uh, you know we're extremely on the analytical side of things. Uh, maybe Elon Musk is on one side of the spectrum and we're on the absolute other side of the spectrum, and we need to move ourselves just a little bit into the center of the spectrum. So what we did is we created one piece of 21st century digital media that uh, I'd love to share with you guys now. In 2010, two accomplished figures in finance got together and took stock of the investment landscape. What did Jerry O'Brien and Warren Staley envision? With their well-earned reputations for investment discipline, risk management, and corporate governance, they founded O'Brien Staley Partners to do something deliberate in investing. Invest in what they want, where they want, with whom they want. Jerry and Warren launched OSP with a curated team of seasoned professionals, considered the best in their field, and who shared their creative vision. Together, the team developed a following for seeing intrinsic value in unloved US CNI credits when others didn't. From TARP securities of community banks in the wake of the Great Recession, to church credits when more traditional investors lost faith in their bonds, and from economic development loans when America's municipalities suffered deficits, to discontinued business lines like aircraft and yacht finance and the turbulent aftermath of bank consolidations, or power line service and high-lift rental equipment credits when commodity prices plummet, even Puerto Rican corporate credits when markets are spooked by the island's broken politics. OSP's long-term success in these neglected niches led to it being trusted by a broad spectrum of institutional investment partners, spanning university endowments, hospital and religious plans, municipal and corporate pension plans, and more. The trust earned through OSP's value investing expertise rapidly expanded to include impact investing, adding to an already impressive range of investment partners and accolades. The Wall Street Journal and the University of Chicago both published articles recognizing OSP for the significant contributions its impact investing is making to disadvantaged communities. These investments have fidelity to both investors and society by delivering consistent market rate returns and measurable societal impact. From real job growth to energy efficiency to intangible assets like civic pride, the impact is being felt all over the country. In similar fashion, OSP's nationwide loan servicer is thriving. Amerinat's veteran team of servicing experts is reshaping their industry by supporting underserved communities, helping hundreds of clients across the country successfully manage their economic development and housing assistance loans. As it grows, 
O'Brien's daily partners will broaden its perspective to span new asset classes and geographies and continue to put forsaken opportunities on a solid foundation to derive benefits for its investors, its team, and society. But it will always be framed by the founder's core principles and its Minnesota roots. Step back and the bigger picture is revealed. O'Brien Staley Partners has assembled all the pieces to realize its vision of a renaissance in investing. So uh, you probably saw it somewhere in that video, there was a little reference to Booth, that school down south and stuff. So I did, I did go there, but I am proud to claim uh, that I was Mitchell Peterson's uh, teaching assistant. So uh, after we're all done here, I'm going to go wherever his new office is. I'll find him and hang out with him. So. Uh, so that's, we're, we're, we're getting towards the end. Are you guys holding back questions? Because you've been, you know, very polite. Anybody have any questions for us? Yeah, please. So you talked a little bit about track record. Yeah. I know that's a pretty challenging thing, especially when you're senior to take with you. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about sort of as you went, you know, along in your career, Carval, how you protected yourself from, you know, I'm assuming the two-year two -year lag was due to some sort of non compete it was you restrictive covenant agreement. About how you made sure that you were protected, and if you want, ended up wanting to go start your own firm, that you could actually take your track record with you. So it's the hardest thing on the planet, right, to make that that pivot. And, and uh, uh, we gave the same presentation at Wharton. They had a lunch and learn. That's what Tristan, you know, heard about. And to come do it here. And down at Wharton, I, I posed this somewhat rhetorical question. I said, you know. Whatever the value, you know, a hundred, hundred and twenty, hundred and fifty thousand dollars starting salary, uh, you know, would you be willing to take, you know, twenty thousand dollars less if the firm gave you full attribution of your track record? Yeah. Would you be willing not to take the job if they didn't? Hmm. That's a tough one, right? And and uh, so we were we were saying, well, what if you got two job offers? One, you know, you really wanted, and one that was okay. You know, would you be willing to go to the one that was okay if they agreed to give you full attribution of your track record? Interesting, right? And so maybe that's the way to do it, cross the bridge before you join. Hey, can I have full attribution of my track record? There's, there's a challenge to people wanting attribution of their track record because everybody wants attribution of the completed deal. <laughs> Nobody wants attribution of the dead deals, right? The, the, the two-thirds of lost expense. Uh, and that's, you know, that'll make a difference between an extracted track record an actual fund record that has all the true expenses and lost deal expenses. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a tough nut to crack, um, and you just kind of have to find your own path, uh, and you have to find your own perfect time and method to negotiate it. Well, you know, well, obviously, you're negotiating for yourself. Um, you know, you have to find the right tone to do that in. That's that's as good as I can get. <laughs> Any other questions, or is that, uh, yeah? You opened up by saying that uh, a lot of people say just raise the fund. And yeah. It's something that's super easy, and a lot of people tend to yeah. overlook challenges and hurdles that they'll have to cross. I guess what were some of those that you faced? And, uh, yeah, I guess in hindsight, what were the key lessons you took away? So everything matters is the key lesson, right? And it's not about raising capital. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I met this guy, and, in, in Connecticut, I didn't have the whole thing together. Uh, but you have to have every single thing because, you know, uh, Pete and Brett and people who are managing endowments and foundations, they're taking a career risk. It's not just a capital risk. They've, you know, put their personal reputation, you know, on the line for you. And they want to make sure you're not going to mess it up with some sort of a footfall. Uh, you know, the, the other thing is just keeping your expense ratio down. I mean, I can remember first time the copy machine doesn't work. Guess whose problem it is? Yours, you know. And uh, so, you know, every every issue it, it matters. I, the uh, uh, the first time the the form ADV was filled out, you know, I said, well, do I have to read that? And you know, the person was kind enough to say, well, I just thought you you know wanted to read everything going on in your firm. And I do, so I had to go and read read that. So uh, I got I got a question uh, at at Wharton. They said. Um, uh, how much of your time is in investor relations? And I said, well, that's easy. It's 100% of my time. I put 100% of my time in investor relations, 100% of my time into investments, and 100% of my time into managing the team, right? And so really, it's, it winds up not being one job. And so when you leave the desk that you've 
gotten your first job on uh, and you thought you were working hard and you thought you were doing 60 or 80 hours a week, you know, well, guess what? You got three jobs now, investments, investor relations, and the firm. And uh, they're all full-time jobs. So, Okay, well, so I can see that you guys have had your lunch and uh, I hope you got the big picture, uh, which, which I was sharing with Rich. You know, it's not just about raising a fund. You gotta build the whole firm and you gotta have the raw ingredients and you have to have the proof of concept uh, before you can go out and evangelize the brand. So I hope this is helpful. I hope those brochures, you know, you put that in your long-term file. We'll be hanging out here for another 15 or 20 minutes before I go up to see Mitchell Peterson <coughs> if you wanna ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you very much for inviting me.